We got a lot of great information today, and sometimes it feels kind of overwhelming, especially for a lot of us who are doing a lot of research. And uh, there's a, there are wonderful websites besides, of course, freedomadvocates.org. Uh, you can go to Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.com. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> and uh, also the Post Sustainability Institute.org. The reason that we call our group Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.org, or COM, excuse me, is because kind of traditionally, this issue has been addressed and focused on by people who are more identified on the other end of the spectrum politically from me. I am a liberal Democrat. I've been registered a Democrat my entire voting life. And uh, when I became aware of the United Nations Agenda 21 through doing research regarding the planning revolution that is happening now, because I am a commercial real estate appraiser with 30 years of eminent domain experience. And so I was researching that and redevelopment, the vampire that never dies. And through that, I found United Nations Agenda 21. Now, as we know, those of us who have been actively fighting it know that you will be marginalized you will be uh, labeled, you will be named, you will be treated as if you are not a serious person, you will be accused of making things up, and you will be called right wing. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can't remember who it was who said that uh, there's two wings on that bird. <laughs> And, uh, and so when I started Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.com, I named it that purposely because I wanted, first of all, to alert my fellow liberals to the fact that there are others of us who have our eyes open and are not being manipulated by the green mask. Yeah. Those flyers that you got that say, notice, this city is a member of ICLEI. Those are for you to take and make copies of. Five bucks, you can make 100 flyers. Take those flyers out in the mornings, put them out around your town on the doorsteps. This is a powerful grassroots movement. That is what we are. This is the real, real, effort that we're making together and we are winning we are winning I am receiving hundreds of emails every single day I have gotten thousands and thousands of contacts from people and that's just me all of us you know I'm not anyone special all of us <laughs> no, all of us are working on this together this, this is the great equalizer, isn't it? Because what is more important to us than our right to free speech and dissent? As individuals in the United States of America, we are guaranteed our liberty, our right to dissent, our right to speak out. This is in danger. And you know, it might seem dramatic. We all have a little different take on things, it seems like, you know, I come from a, come out of the left, it's kind of hard for me to talk about communism. <laughs> you know, it kind of feels like, you know, anachronistic maybe, or maybe just kind of a little bit crazy. But, you know, <clears throat> if I were an environmentalist, which I thought I was, but now I'm not sure, <laughs> um, I'd be pretty pissed off because my movement has been hijacked. And those of us on the left need to take a look at that. Using the cover of environmentalism, the rigid control of a totalitarian state is in progress, and that is what is behind the green mask. That is what is behind the green mask. <laughs> it's like 
okay. Enough of that, enough of that. Hey, you know what? I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. I, you know, it's kind of hard to be either one or anything right now because um, if they're not talking about UN Agenda 21, sustainable development, I don't care what color they come in. We're not a bunch, of, we're not a gang flashing our colors here. This is about our freedom as Americans, okay? Yeah. It's an abuse of trust. And you know, they've got the rhetoric. They really do. Boy, it sounds so good. But you know what? Just like any victim of oppression, you have to look at your abuser and say, it's not what you say, it's what you do. It's not your rhetoric, it's what you do with it. Okay? So we've got, what do we have? We have our abuser saying they want community, capacity building, green jobs, and the American dream. Well, I thought we had the American dream. You work real hard, you go to school, you learn how to do something, and then you do it. <laughs> but now we're seeing a destabilized economy, a housing market that has completely collapsed, and most of us had whatever wealth we have. And wealth, you know, to me, wealth, you know, that just seems like so huge, you know, but really it's just like if you've got two nickels to rub together, a lot of times it's because you have a house. And I'm not talking about that you speculated and you, you know, thought you were going to make a killing. I'm saying that you bought a property to live in and you, you know, scraped together your down payment and you got a loan and you were told that, hey, that, <laughs> that interest rate, that 2%, that teaser rate, that thing that dragged you in and made you scrape together your down payment, that's going to last, you know, that you can, you can count on that rate, you know. That thing should have come with a bankruptcy handbook, right? <laughs> when you signed on the dotted line there, a lot of those uh, uh, brokers lost everything. So what do we have now? We've got a destabilized economy, destabilized housing market, we've got community, We've got communities that are tearing each other apart over bike lanes, over bike, uh, bicycle boulevards, over, <laughs> you know, leaf blowers, right, over smoking in your apartment, over, uh, I don't know, green jobs, over where we're going to put our few dollars, over where, whether we're going to water our park or not. Right. <laughs> okay, your, your educational system is in a shambles. And your healthcare system. This is a corporatocracy. That's what we're looking at here. It is a totalitarian state. It's a corporatocracy. Communitarianism is the balancing of, ind of the individual's rights with the rights of the community. Now that's a nice little teeter-totter idea, except that one side's got a brick on it and the other side has a feather. Your individual rights are always, always superseded by the rights of the community. Now what are the rights of the community? We are Americans. We go by our Constitution. That guarantees our individual rights. Right? Okay, we got those rights. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, whatever that is. Keep your nose out of my life, I'll stay out of yours. But the rights of the community, what are those? They are the ever-shifting, non-defined rights that are identified in whatever way whoever's running the government is going to decide that they are now. It sounds good, you're going to be safer you're going to be healthier and you're going to be more equal. More equal. You're going to be more equal. That's the rhetoric of the abuser. When you think about communitarianism, I like to use this visual image because it's, it's a good one. Think about, um, you've got a table with two glasses on it. You've got a glass of water. Think of that as your constitutional republic. On the other side, you've got a glass of milk. That is a communitarian state. 
Now you're going to get a glass pitcher, clear glass pitcher, you're going to put it down on the table. And you're going to take your two glasses and you're going to pour them together into that pitcher. What do you have? You've got milk. You've got milky water. Your water has been subsumed into and absorbed by the milk. Your communitarian state overrides your individual rights. And we're starting to see what that looks like. Now, you know, <clears throat> we've had a lot of time here to experience United Nations Agenda 21. And it is not a, it doesn't come with flashing lights, it's not a, you know, not driving through your town on a bulldozer. It comes in many names and many guises, and it has been in the works for a long time. And that is how your government and your public-private partnership entities can sideline you, malign you, mock you, and trash you when you suggest that a United Nations program is actually having an effect on your life here in the United States, right here in your local community. Well, you know, you just have to take a step back, don't you, and just take a look at what is happening. Now, we have a short lifespan. We live 70 years, maybe. Maybe we live a little longer, a little, little shorter. And during that time we go to school for a few years and we may not have had a very good education. We don't know too much about what came before and we may not be recognizing like that frog in the pot that the water is getting hotter. And we'll, you know, those of us who are towards the end of our lives will be boiled away and those who come up will say this is normal. All totalitarian states operate on a few premises. And these are control, total information, restriction of movement, surveillance, loss of free speech. They all have a philosophy too. It's for the common good. The individual's rights are considered to be selfish. If you're thinking about yourself, you should be ashamed. You should be thinking about the entire community, the common good. They have a concept of Spartanism. That feeling that you need to pull in, you need to conserve, you need to use less. Am I against that? Am I, you know, am I some hog who's into blowing the tops off of mountains and using every possible thing I can because I'm just a pig? No. Not at all. Are we glad to hear that? But uh, no, and I don't think any of us are. We're Americans. We want to, we preserve our nation. We love our nation. We want to preserve it. We want to preserve our oceans, our forests, our grasslands, our beautiful natural environment that we have. But we also want to be able to move freely. We want to live without surveillance. We want to live with full opportunity for dissent. Now, all, all uh, totalitarian states also share another concept, which is the concept of the glorious future. You might be living in hell right now, but your future is going to be great. Thinking about the future of those who will come after you, people who are not born now but will be born in the future, the concept that we need to work together now to make things good for those who come after us. Now this is part of the American dream, right? Whose folks didn't come here from another country thinking that, you know, legally, thinking that they were going to <laughs> wait in an Ellis Island or wherever and thinking that they were going to work hard and make their lives better and make their children's lives better. We can't expect that so much anymore, can we? A lot of people have their kids moving back in with them. A lot of people have lost their jobs. This is a difficult time. That Spartan concept is in our lives now. The sense of the glorious future, protecting the future of the people who are unborn. The terror is an element of this. Now, instead of uh, you know, seeing people in jackboots out in our streets, we have the, this conceptual terror. Okay? We, the, the war on terror is a war on you. And I know you know that. 
because you're submitting to searches at the airport, aren't you? Have you been patted down yet? <laughs> you know, this is what a state does. Communism, fascism, Nazism. They all share these things in common. These are all communitarian states. <clears throat> I got something from the FBI because I'm a liberal. I, excuse me. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> got that wrong. It's from the ACLU about the FBI. And that's, I, get, I hope the FBI doesn't bother me. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the ACLU sent, uh, sent this to all their members. And they said, hey, the FBI is now going through your trash. And uh, they have surveillance power. It was given to them by Attorney General Eric Holder. Now, um, that's the second Attorney General to redefine your rights and freedoms because uh, under Bush, we had uh, we were told that it's not t it's not uh, it's not torture if we're doing it. So uh, now we've got domestic surveillance. Domestic surveillance. <laughs> and they're not keeping it a secret either. So here's this thing. This is the tiniest spy plane ever. It looks like a hummingbird. Looks just like a hummingbird. It's only about six inches. It can fly eight miles. It can go in and out of a doorway. It, can, it has vis uh, you know, visual and audio. And uh, it's under the Pentagon, it's developing it. They've got it now. And my favorite part of this, uh, this is from the New York Times. My favorite part <clears throat> of this little, uh, it's from the LA Times. My favorite part of this article is when the, um, the guy from the Pentagon says um, that, you know, it looks like a hummingbird now, but that's just the prototype because, you know, there aren't that many hummingbirds in <laughs> New York City. <laughs> New York City? Now, I wasn't expecting to see New York City. That's the very last thing in the article. And I was like, <laughs> New York City, they're talking about domestic surveillance. OK, if you have any doubts about communitarianism in the United States, communitarianism, the rights of the community come beyond and above the rights of the individual. You've got the perfect example in the Kelo decision, the, nine, the 2005 Supreme Court decision. The Supreme Court of the land of the United States said that you just don't have no property rights anymore. That if you own a piece of property and you are in a town and your town says, hey, Joe, you've got this commercial piece of property, but this guy, thinks that he can make more money on that corner with his shop than you can. So we're going to acquire you by eminent domain through redevelopment, redevelopment. We're going to acquire your property and we're going to give it to this other guy because he can pay more property tax and sales tax than you can. And that is for the common good. We're talking about more tax dollars for your town, so hey, Come on, you can't be against that, can you? Because it's better for the entire community. And you can't be greedy and just think that it's all about you and your property rights because, hey, this is for everybody. So the greater good is whatever your government says it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ends justify the means. Now. Uh, Michael had a great slide up there, and, and it was from the United Nations uh, Habitat One, which was the, it came before the uh, 1992 Rio uh, Earth Summit. This was in 1976. It was Habitat One, and that's where they, you know, you can go online. This is not, everything I'm saying is the truth. Nothing is speculation. There's all total documentation. Okay, and if you're paying attention in your town, you know that you've seen it right down there in River City. <laughs> so here they go. You have this up there. I'm going to say it again. Land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset, controlled by individuals, and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrumentation of accumulation 
and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. <laughs> Public control of land therefore is indispensable. Now, public control of land, therefore, is indispensable. I don't know about you, but right here in Santa Rosa, California, a town of 170,000 people in a quasi-rural community, we can't keep our streetlights on. Our parks are dead, and our council is cutting whatever they can possibly cut they should cut a lot of the city staff jobs. But uh, here, here we go from the Urban Land Institute. We see the answer to all of these vacant commercial properties, vacant large commercial properties. And I'm going to talk about why you're seeing so many of these and why this is the goal. Because what you see now is the goal. What you're experiencing now is what was intended. This is not an accident. We didn't just like crash by accident. Everything that has happened was done by design. This is all purposeful. So now we have um, from vacant properties to green space. These are called red fields. Okay, you got commercial properties that are sitting vacant, commercial properties that are sitting vacant. These are shopping centers. They're Retail properties, they've been abandoned. No, not really. They've been taken over by the banks for non-payment. And the cities go to the banks and they go, hey, we got an idea for you. You want to get that off your books? We'll acquire it under eminent domain and then we'll demo the buildings and we'll take it and we'll make it into parks. Well, your city, you know, doesn't have enough money to keep your street lights on, so how are they going to do that? They're going to do it with a $1 trillion federal program. This is proposed by the City Parks Alliance, a Washington, D.C. national network of urban park and recreation leaders. A $1 trillion federal program would enable local municipalities to acquire vacant properties and demolish. These are not vacant like lots. These are buildings. They're going to demo them. And somehow this is going to put hundreds of thousands of people to work. I don't know. I don't know how. Maybe for a minute. Maybe for a minute. Now, I'll tell you, I've had this hanging in my office for years. I'm a commercial appraiser. I am an eminent domain expert and a land use expert. And I uh, testify. I'm a litigation support person. And uh, I know that there's a planning revolution that's been going on for a long time. And you can't seem to get anyone to notice it unless you just talk about it directly. So that's what I've been doing. I go to staff meetings. I'm, I'm a district branch chief. I bring it up in a staff meeting. I have everyone staring at me with their mouths open like, what are you talking about? You've got to talk about this everywhere. Take your nerve in your hand and talk about this everywhere you can. So 1999, Fannie Mae eases credit to aid mortgage lending, right? They said that under increasing pressure, this is from the New York Times, September 30th, 1999, under increasing pressure from the Clinton administration to expand mortgage loans among low and moderate income people, Fannie Mae eased the credit requirements so they could get loans. Now they said they were taking on significantly more risk and they could run into trouble in an economic downturn, but that's not going to happen. And they also said, this is in the New York Times in 1999, they said that if they fail, the government will have to step up and bail them out the way that they had to during the savings and loan crisis. So this was an engineered crisis. The banks, the bank collapse, that was a payoff, of course, what happened. What was the end result of the bank collapse was that the big banks took over the little banks and you lost your house. 
There's a manipulation. They used greed, of course, but greed is just how they manipulate people, right? Those are the minions. They're manipulated through greed. The planning revolution, the planning revolution that we've experienced is part of the green mask. Affordable housing and public transportation together. And what do you get? You get a housing glut, you get a destabilized economy, and you get more poor, dependent people. People who are dependent on the government. Do I think affordable housing is good? Yeah, sure I do. I think it's great. We've got a Section 8 voucher program. You can own, I can own an apartment building and my tenant comes to me and says, hey Rosa, I'm poor and uh, the, the city is going to pay you a portion of my rent. I can live anywhere I want in town. That's great. That allows me to have a, a, an apartment building and you to live wherever you want. Affordable housing Affordable housing is glutting our communities. Affordable housing, mixed use housing is smart growth. Smart growth, smart growth, okay? There's two words there, smart and growth. Don't forget the growth, because that's what it's about. This is about public-private partnerships, regional public-private partnerships, okay? Transportation and housing. You never thought they went together, but they do. Well, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, all this makes sense. And every once in a while, you get in there and you, I lose my way sometimes because it makes sense to me. And then I come up against it and I realize that it's about control. It's about taking control of your life. If you raise your voice against these issues, you will be attacked, you will be abused, you will be maligned, you will be sidelined. If these plans were so good, they wouldn't have to use this kind of pressure on people who speak out about them. Okay, so we've got public-private partnerships. That means your money and some guy's business. Okay, your tax dollars. What does that do? It ensures that he has a safety net under him. So of course he's going to build the hell out of your center of your town and pack it full of a bunch of uh, units that never get filled up and ground floor retail that is configured so poorly and is so expensive on a price per square foot that nobody can afford to go in there. And how many coffee shops do you need anyway? Okay. Yeah, more. Have some coffee. Okay, so you got your low income housing. Now let me just tell you a little something. I, I'm, I, what can I say? I have no life. This is all I'm doing. Of course, don't tell my boss. <laughs> no, really, I'm working still. Um, but <laughs> it's Saturday. Okay. Um, Enterprise community development. Enterprise community development. That's one of the nation's largest low-income housing developers. 280,000 units across the United States. They have 11 billion dollars in leverage. There's a couple of big companies like this. We're talking big, big, big. Okay? They are connected. Well, who are they not connected to? But they are connected to the Thunderhead Alliance. And let me just tell you a little bit about those guys. They call themselves People Powered Movement now. I think it's peoplepoweredmovement.org. Now the reason you need to care about this is because they are a, an advocacy lobbying group for bicycle coalitions. Now, I ride a bike. I think bikes are cool. I like the idea of being safe on my bike. And I think it's a good thing. They're getting a lot of transportation dollars now. Yeah, that's a lot of transportation dollars that's going for bicycles. Now, when you find that Thunderhead Alliance, now called the People Powered Movement, is putting on seminars every year for people who are on, in bicycle coalitions. And what they are training them to do is to be candidates for office. They're training them to agitate for smart growth. 
Now, smart growth isn't just an apartment house with a, you know, a coffee shop downstairs, okay? That's what the building might look like, but that's not what it is. It's a way to pass money from your tax dollars into a certain group. You might have the Greenbelt Alliance. You've got, uh, well, let's look at One Bay Area, why don't we, okay? We've got Reconnecting America, which is a group, they do, uh, they, they do this, their Center for Transit-Oriented Development and Transportation for America. These groups, I'll tell you, if you've got three people, you've got nine groups. <laughs> no wonder we can't keep up with it. You know, hey, if you're a website developer, you must be really cruising now, because <laughs> these guys all have their websites. They've all got their sitting on each other's boards. You know, we better take a lesson from this. And uh, they're lobbying the feds and the locals for money. They want transportational, uh, transformational policy. Okay, now, I've talked about this before, redevelopment. Redevelopment is the unknown government. It's, got, it's coming out of its box though. People are getting hip to it. It's a ripoff. Um, wow, look at that, $80 billion in debt, and that's just in California. No, there's more than that. Oh, it's more than that. Over hey, 94. all right, it's over 90. This is an old book. It's a 2007 book. Okay, now, this uh, you can get this online. You can get it on my website, Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.com. It's on our source sites page. You can get it. What you need to know is that your property tax dollars are paying for all of this. What is all of this? It is the center of your city is being transformed and the purpose of that is to encourage with an arm-breaking, leg-smashing sense of the word you to get out of the suburb, out of the rural areas and into the center of town where we can move you more efficiently through transit but really it's to surveil you, manage you, control you we're going to have our centers of our cities ringed by food sheds. What's a food shed if you're a locavore? Hey, who doesn't want to be a locavore? I love going to the farmer's market. I want to support my local people. I want to support local farming. Who doesn't? This is way beyond that, though. Take a look at Cornell University's website. Google that along with food sheds. Cornell and food sheds. You're going to find that you've got the center of your community, town, transit village, excuse me. It's called a transit village now. <laughs> and then around that, you're gonna have <clears throat> land that can be, they're gonna determine how many calories can be grown on that land. And then you can determine how many people that transit village can support. And you can't have any more than that. Or I guess they'll reduce the amount of calories you need. <laughs> Now, that's, that's coming. That's in our future. It's not too long in our future. This is the new urbanism. It is a failure. It's a failure except unless you look at it from their point of view, in which case it's a tremendous success. If you have a housing glut, crashed property values, vacant buildings in the center of your town, transit dollars that are being diverted to some not smart train that's going nowhere or your high speed train in California that's going to go from Fresno to Bakersfield <laughs> in 2020 <laughs> I can't wait for that, I don't know about you that's where your money's going. Okay now when you think about this I'll tell you, you know None of us have to do anything. You just have to buy about a million copies of 1984 and give it out. <laughs> really, because you know what? The center of that book, I just read that book again. I read it every once in a while just for miserable entertainment. <laughs> anyway, the very center of the book, I mean, the whole you know, story is like candy, right? But there's a kernel center there. It's about four, five, six pages long. That's all. Just read that center of the book and it tells you what is happening now. And it says that the purpose of government 
when you're under a totalitarian state is to waste your resources. To waste your resources. They do not want you gaining wealth, like we're all so wealthy. They don't want you gaining wealth. They want you to have a lot of needs. They want you to be controlled. They want, who's they? People say, okay, Rosa, so who's they? I get this when I get interviewed by newspapers. So who's they again? <laughs> Them is who they is. <laughs> I mean, come on. No, it's your government, okay? It's your go Good grief. I mean, come on. If you get involved in local politics, if you get involved in local politics, you are going to find the miserable, sad truth, which is either they are too damn stupid to find their way out of the room, or, and very much more likely, yeah. is that they are where they are because there's a lot of money backing them. Private money is backing people, developer money, union money, and I say this, I was a union member for 30 years, two different unions, they are besmirching the name of Cesar Chavez with their union thuggery. Because those of us who've been in unions or are in unions now, do you know where your union dues are going? You, yes. Those union dues are going to elect the people who are grinding you under their feet for a few bucks. I don't fool myself that these are people who have some high moral standards. In fact, I know for sure they don't. Instead, these are people who can be bought. And if you want to get into public office, it's pretty likely that you're going to be somebody who's bought. I'm going to, I may give it a try. I doubt I'm, no. be a total miracle, you know. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, listen. It doesn't matter if you win, Rosa. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you bet. Yeah, real fun. Real fun. Yeah, they put you through hell. Well, you know, they've already said, they've already said everything about me that they can say. And uh, I guess, I mean, I've already said it all about myself. So what are they going to do, out me? Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> something to know about. Okay, now Michael laid it out really well. The COGS, the uh, Councils of Government, ABAG, uh, that's the um, Associated Bay Area Governments, nine, nine Bay Area Counties, Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Um, they've aligned themselves with uh, a couple of groups that are green groups. And these groups have huge funding. I'm talking about multi-million dollars. And if you go back and you look at their, I forget what they call the form, but the form they have to file for their taxes. And you take it, okay, so this year it's like, you know, their first year there was like, you know, they had like $50,000. Their second year they had 500,000. Their third year they had 3 million. And now they're up to 20 million. Who are these people? They got big money, right? New, uh, Silicon Valley Foundation. The Greenbelt Alliance, Sonoma County Conservation Action, California Infill Builders, these are great. These guys, you know, and they're all on each other's boards. And they're developers, developers who, uh, you know, they say, well, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna hide in the background here while you go out there, you Mr. Green in your little green vest and little green suit and talk about some bug. And we're gonna be back there. We want, we're paying you protection money we're going to pay you to not go down to the council meeting and say that you object to our project. Or we're going to pay you to go down and object to somebody else's project. We're talking about real moral people here. If you want to have some entertainment, go to nrdc.org. Oh. Natural Resources Defense Council.org. Put that together with smart growth in your, in your uh, put in our national natural resources defense council and smart growth in your search browser. And you're going to come up with a great, oh I love this, this is fun because if you're, you know, if you like stuff like this you're going to have a good time. It's, um, they come, you come up and you got a, a web page that says picture smart growth. Picture smart growth. It's a, you know, typical, and they've got this for communities all over the nation. They've got the, the, you know, the map of the U.S., right? 
with big dots on it and you click on one and it comes up with a photograph of an intersection or a street okay and then what well, before your eyes it's magic it morphs into smart growth well they always look the same I don't care where the heck they are they could be out in, <laughs> they could be out in the middle of you know pull you up or whatever you know some place out in the middle of you know the desert but they all end up looking the same street trees I love trees both sides of, okay you're you're out there you're looking you're, you can see forever suddenly on either side of the street pops up ground floor retail two to three stories of residential all over the place and all these happy people on bikes <laughs> recreating nobody's working because they're all living on the government dime and you know what it's not going to look like that okay in fact go around your community and look at stuff that got built during that big boom it's T111 siding that's uh, sagging, that's peeling, that's coming loose. Uh, it's not, you know, looking that good anymore. It's vacant. It doesn't matter that it's vacant because they already got their money. The city got their fees. The developer got his money. The bank got guaranteed by your redevelopment dollars, which stop your general fund from being fully funded because as soon as your area is declared blighted boy they stop those property taxes from going into your general fund going into the state going into the county going for your parks your hospitals your schools your roads and instead they go to the redevelopment agency for the next thirty to forty five years to pay off bond debt they go to the bond brokers that's where the money goes your money goes to bond brokers and so they quickly in debt themselves they get that money this is your redevelopment agency in your community now you've heard a lot about redevelopment lately and you're being propagandized okay I have heard uh, that the okay now the state's saying hey man this is enough you gotta backfill some of this stuff you've been ripping us off for years and we need some of that money to come back to the state. Well, your local redevelopment agencies are calling that, uh, they're saying it's kidnapping, it's ransom. I said, you know what? It's a good choice of words you're using there because it's a pirate agency. <laughs> it's stealing your money. True. Okay? So, anyway, I want to tell you about this. This is Plan Bay Area. Plan Bay Area. OneBayArea.org onebayarea.org. Now, if you're not in California, doesn't matter. It's just got another name where you live. In this case, this is Metropolitan Transportation Commission and uh, what they're doing with their $200 billion in transportation dollars over the next, I don't know, what is it, 20 years? 25 years. Okay, 25 years, 200 billion bucks. You got 100 towns in nine counties and if they want any of that money, any of that transportation tax money, they better build smart growth or they're not getting it. And not only do they have to build smart growth, but they have to build smart growth where MTC says they have to build smart growth. And where is that? It's in a redevelopment area. Now what does that mean? Listen, this is important. It's not just that you have to build smart growth in a redevelopment area. It's that if your community, your city, wants to get any of that $200 billion in, prop, in transportation dollars over the next 25 years, they can only issue housing permits, this is mainly housing, in the areas that are identified by MTC. They consider that for absorption purposes, they, have, they determine how many units need to be built in your area and they identify the location, literally, of where those housing units have to be built. And they're all in the center of your city in a redevelopment area, almost every one of them. I called up and I interviewed the head of the program. He got pretty upset with me. I was, you know, I'm a professional. I said, you know, I'm calling. I'm, I'm calling because I'm, I work for uh, the Department of Transportation, and I want you to know that you're having an impact on land value, because what you're doing is you're saying that the only development that, it, that can occur in 100 cities in nine Bay Area counties has to be in a specific location. I said, do you know what you're doing? 
Do you realize that you're having a tremendous impact that stealthily people are going to run to those locations and acquire property? And uh, it doesn't matter if you're in the urban growth boundary, forget about that. Forget that. That's irrelevant now because if you want development, it's going to be in those locations or those towns are not getting any of that $200 billion. That's a lot of money. So I said, do you realize you're having an impact on property tax values? <laughs> so he started to try and tell me about property tax values. <laughs> I said, honey, I'm sorry, but you just don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I said, 30 years of valuation experience for the Department of Transportation, litigation experience, I'm telling you that you were having a big impact on property value and you have not taken this into consideration and you better think about it because what you're telling people is that unless you own property in those specific locations your land if you have not already built on it is worth nothing that's a big deal okay now there are some cities that have woken up to that and are trying to get off that little gravy train and fight it but uh, you know, you're told this is the propaganda, right? Here's the green mask. Smart growth is good for you. It's good for the planet. It's developer driven. It's developer sponsored community groups, environmental groups, and candidates. You're. <laughs> this stuff's so good, you don't have to make anything up. <laughs> Honestly, the Smart Growth Caucus. Now, <clears throat> Pat Wiggins. Now, Pat Wiggins, poor thing, she had Alzheimer's. They didn't want to tell anybody. They didn't want anybody to notice. I don't know if it's Alzheimer's, but she was completely unable to govern. Let's put it like that. I, you know, I had, uh, you know, I tried to, uh, in my small way, do something about having Pat Wiggins removed. And, uh, but the problem was that Pat Wiggins was a placeholder for Noreen Evans, who is the senator now. Noreen Evans was the assemblywoman, and she was the placeholder for Michael Allen, who is a local, who was a local person, union. Per this guy has so many hats; he's like buried under him. He's a union person. He's a, um, I don't know, what is he? he was uh, ran for council. He failed. He uh, was a uh, Solar Sonoma County. He's a, oh, he was uh, Pat Wiggins's uh, field representative. He was writing. I can't prove this. I think he was probably writing legislation when she was unable to tie her shoes. So now he's been elected to the assembly. I reported him to the FPPC for a conflict of interest, serious conflict of interest, and he was busted by the FPPC. Unfortunately, don't clap too soon. Yes, it's great, but he was still elected. Now, what does it take? Okay, so you've got your smart, okay, so the reason I brought up Pat Wiggins, really, is because the Legislative Caucus has a Smart Growth Caucus, the Smart Growth Caucus in our legislature. This is across the nation. Here's the EPA, the EPA Environmental Protection Agency, <clears throat> Smart Growth. Every one of these agencies has its Smart Growth, uh, you know, page. Right? Because smart growth was required by the President's Council on Sustainable Development in 1993. And all of these different agencies have this in their, uh, you know, this is part of their administration. Okay? This is not, you know, we're not talking about some fantasy here. This is all happening and it's real. Okay, smart growth is across the United States, it, it's a requirement. They are using EPA challenge grants. Redevelopment, eminent domain, your local tax dollars. This is Agenda 21. They are building the hardscape for your future. Poverty is in your future. Poverty and dependence on the government is your future. Okay, they populate this with selected leaders, neighborhood leaders. It's designed to fail. Their rhetoric they can't stand up to the truth, which is when they talk about consensus, when they talk about consensus, now you've got a dictionary, and when you look that up in your dictionary, consensus means agreement of all parties. The new consensus from the President's Council on Sustainable Development in 1993, they wrote a book called Building America or something, Smart America, or I forget what it's called. The new consensus, right? That is neutralizing the opposition. 
That's your government. Neutralizing the opposition. This is regulated, managed, and manipulated citizens. They call that the new consensus. When you go and you get Delphi'd in a meeting, when you come in and there's, you know, you're basically, your voice isn't heard, whatever, you can, you can sing and dance and do a strip for all they care. They're still going to do whatever it was they were going to do at the end of the night after you leave. They got you in the room and they say, hey, we had 100 people here today. We're going to put that in our report. 100 people, we did our outreach to the community. Doesn't matter what you say in there. You could, 110 people could be against it out of the 100 people. And they're still going to do it anyway. Now, uh, neighborhood summit. You got a neighborhood summit going in your community? If you don't now, you will. Seattle, what is it about Seattle? Too much rain or something up there. It's, grows this stuff. Okay, Neighborhood Summit, they've got what they call the Strong Neighborhoods Initiative. Look out for that. You know, op, hey, Machiavelli, you, don't, you can just go back to 1475, right? Machiavelli wrote all this stuff up. I think that was the only book Bush said he read, Bush Jr. Oh, right, you don't laugh. So don't, I told you I was a Democrat, you know. Um, <laughs> he said he read it every year, he had to. It's a little book. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, Machiavelli said, Machiavelli said, you know, do one thing, say, you know, say one thing and do the other. Make sure your rhetoric's right, but do whatever it takes to stay on top. And that's what they're doing. They call it strong neighborhoods. They go and they farm the community. Oh, you got a neighborhood over here. Well, you, we, don't you want a strong neighborhood? We're going to put a facilitator in your community who's going to be your neighborhood association head who's going to uh, speak for you, right? They've got bike coalitions. They've got, uh, which are backed by enterprise community development. Did I forget to say that? The Thunderhead Alliance, oh, I got to go back to that. Thunderhead Alliance, power, people powered movement, they had on their board enterprise community development. Remember I told you it's 100, uh, you know, what was it, 280,000 units across the US. They are the shock troops for redevelopment. They are the shock troops for the huge developers. We're not talking about Joe and Bill, local guys. We're talking about the big developers that want all of those tax dollars. That's some huge money. And they are insured. They, have, they get no recourse loans, which means you don't got to pay them back. Okay, that's pretty serious stuff, you know. So uh, by coalitions, the Lung Association. Here we go, we got uh, Neighborhood Summit, you know, this is in Santa Rosa right now. The person who's uh, putting this together is a woman who uh, doesn't tell you this on this flyer for the Neighborhood Summit, but she's on the uh, board of the Leadership Institute of Ecology and the Economy. I prefer to call it by its initials, LIE. <laughs> and... <laughs> Darn, why didn't we think of that? And uh, <clears throat> she... Uh, She's also on the community advisory board. She's the chair. They really, I mean, I'm talking about groups that get financing. They are paid facilitators. You go into a room and you don't know. You don't know that they're paid facilitators. You're sitting in there till 10 o'clock at night in your council meeting, and there's somebody, half the people, a bunch of the people in there are paid to sit there and talk about your community. And this is what we want. We want smart growth, right? Here's, we got a guy on council. Don't get me started. We got a guy on council. His name is Gary Wysocki. <clears throat> he was the president of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition, right? This is a couple years ago. He went to, he goes to these trainings. He went to the training for the Thunderhead Alliance that says that uh, they, uh, it's complete streets, right? They promote complete streets. They teach you at these trainings how to neutralize and convert your enemies. He says, this was a how-to kit for influencing public policy. I learned methods and tactics I have used on a regular basis. It's now board policy that at least one member each year attend a Thunderhead training. That was Gary Wysocki when he was president of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. But, you know, Gary got a little backing, I guess, and he decided that he wanted to sit on council. And he wanted to be a neighborhood leader, but the problem was that somebody else was the president of the neighborhood association. Somebody who was democratically elected to that position. 
That was my partner, Kay Tokarud. She, was, she wanted to give back to her community. We were fighting, we were suing the city to stop a huge 1,100 acre redevelopment project here in Santa Rosa. It goes all the way through the center of town. And we don't live in that area. And she said, you know, this is, there's a lot of fighting and we're, we're fighting all, I want to give back, I want to be, I want to have some peace, a peaceful element of my, of my civic uh, duty and I'm gonna I will go and and uh, work on my neighborhood association right well she got elected to the pre as president well about a month or so later I guess Gary Wysocki got notified that uh, he was getting tapped to go on to council and they looked around for what they could do with him to make him look like he was a neighborhood leader and they decided that they wanted to get rid of a democratically elected neighborhood leader and so they harassed her and we had no idea why these people hated us so much and why were they so in favor of redevelopment we had no idea that redevelopment is a funding mechanism for agenda 21 <coughs> redevelopment funds smart growth it funds agenda 21 and it is a very powerful tool as they call it for them they can take your property by eminent domain. Now we were fighting eminent domain and redevelopment and they went after Kay, they harassed her, they, I expected them to burn a cross on our lawn. Until they finally got her, they threatened her with a, a trial, they called her a disagreeable character. If you've ever met her, that's the total opposite of who she is. But they wanted that position for Gary Wysocki. And as soon as they, they uh, the board, this was the board, not the, not the citizens, the community voted for her. But the board, they installed themselves and then they got together and they harassed her to the point where she said, okay, I will just step away and I will be a member at large. And Gary Wysocki was appointed president of the Neighborhood Association and then about a month later he announced that he was a neighborhood leader running for council. Now this is the kind of thing that happens in your community. This is anti-small business, it's a corporatocracy, you have a loss of diversity, a loss of community, you've got displacement, it's the opposite of what they say they're doing. It destroys culture. It destroys culture. We have culture because we, you know, we live in a community long term, we know each other. When you're building apartments in the center of town, you're building transient housing. You are building housing for people who don't stay, don't really care about the community, don't have an investment in the community, aren't connected to the community. That's what they're building. You have no privacy, you have restrictions on, your, on how you can live, you've got a condo association board, you've got a residence association board, you know, controlling you this run by, it's fanaticism, isn't it? Zealots. I'll tell you what, here's a cool one. I'm, I'm, I don't want to drag this on, but I could talk forever, okay? The National Park Service is now trying to close Drake's Bay Oyster Company. 71 years they've been out there in Tomales Bay. They want it designated an official <clears throat> wilderness. It's now designated potential, but if they call it a designated wilderness, designated official wilderness, that means no human habitation, no human activity. Mistakes made, mistakes made in the Point Reyes study. Mistakes made, these are no mistakes. These guys should be in jail. This is what they did. The, who's they? The National Park Service scientists wanted that oyster operation out of there so badly. They wanted to designate that a wilderness so badly that they falsified documents. They refused to submit 250,000 photographs showing that there was absolutely no impact on the wildlife there by the good people at the oyster company in Drake's Bay. Those people those people are fighting for their lives. This is what we have. It's a whole life plan, okay? This is a whole life plan. It impacts your land use, your energy, your transportation, your housing, your food production, your health, your education. This is communitarian law. It's designed to silence your life, your, your voice, block your dissent, 
take away your anonymity, your privacy. Okay, what can you do? There's a lot, there is a lot that you can do. This is the beginning. You're doing a lot of it. This is happening all over the United States. I'm getting invited to, to speak all over the United States. Michael gets, goes all over the US. You don't need a hero. There's a lot of information, it's available. Get a group together in your home, it, get a group together in a small hall and talk about it. Do the best you can. Whatever you do, it's better than not doing it at all. You want to keep your eyes open. You want to put your connections together. You want to see who's who. You know, that neighborhood board that, that harassed Kay? Who was on that board? That was Jenny Bard with the Lung Association. She's the director of advocacy and communications. What does the Lung Association do? You go to their advocacy page, they advocate for smart growth. The other guy who was uh, heading up this uh, neighborhood alliance was Jim Wilkinson. He passed away after this. I think it was too much for him. He was <clears throat> retired United Nations diplomat in our town. He was the head of the UN USA of Sonoma County. You never knew there was a UN USA group, did ya? I sure didn't. But there is. It's across the United States. In many, if not most towns, there's a UN United Nations Association USA. These are community groups. They, they basically infiltrated our neighborhood and controlled it. And they never, even when he died in his, uh, in his uh, obituary, it never mentioned it. There was another guy in there, Fred Krueger, National Religious Coalition of Creation Care. <laughs> Now this is really, I'm not going to get into this, it's, it's late, but uh, you know, <clears throat> there's a uh, Yale University, the uh, chair of the, uh, I forget which department, but it's Mary Evelyn Tucker. She, <clears throat> she's, uh, she's the chair of the joint, I think she's got a degree in forestry and religion. <laughs> and it's the Department of Ecology and Religion. And she's paralyzingly boring. Not like me. But uh, I, have, <laughs> I have watched a few of her YouTubes. Hey, Mary. But uh, <clears throat> she, uh, what does she talk about? She, talk, she says that religion is going to have to go through a major transformation if it doesn't want to disintegrate. Because you've got to get on board with the ecology of the earth. And you've got to get on board with green. And, you know, these are issues that impact all of us, no matter what your politics are, no matter whether you're uh, agnostic, atheist, religious, whatever. Wherever this button hits you, grab onto it, because it's not what is UN Agenda 21, it's what isn't. And I'll tell you, I've thought a lot about it, and I can't think of anything that isn't. <laughs> We've got asset-based community development, which is going to have you going door to door, mapping your neighborhood. Right here, Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa newspaper. I think it's yesterday. No, Friday. Friday, groups organized for disaster readiness. Map your neighborhood. Now, they call it disaster readiness, but they find out who lives in your house, all your assets. Oh, I got a great one. I got an email yesterday from somebody in Wyoming. The Wyoming Department of Agriculture is helping farmers, helping Farmers do estate planning. What the heck are they doing going out and helping farmers do estate planning for? Are they going to encourage them, convince them, break their arms and legs to do conservation easements? Conservation easements. Okay? You can do a lot. Put those flyers out there. Make it look official. Make it look real official. Notice, the city of Santa Rosa is in the process of imposing green building requirements on all existing buildings that will impact your home and business. We stopped that, 7,000 flyers. Okay, this is what happens to you though. You get a nice little article. I've gotten so many articles written about me. I got a nice scrapbook. Um, they'll lie about you, they'll trash you. You know what? So what? It's all about keeping our freedom, isn't it? If we don't have our freedom, who cares? This is, I, you know, that is part of communitarianism. Get your mind around this. 
The idea of communitarianism is that you can find total freedom, full freedom, only when you're in slavery. In slavery to the state, and then within that, you've got total freedom. I love being in a cage, how about you? Okay, we can stop this together. We gotta stop blaming right and left, forget it. Democrats, Republicans, forget it. Yeah, those labels, they just divide us. And that's the scariest thing to the people who are running things is that we might get together. Don't let them break us up. We are together, we are Americans, and we can do this. Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> okay, now, I just want to tell you that um, I love to sign off on my emails with this awareness. Awareness is the first step in the resistance. And welcome to the resistance. Yeah. You are in the resistance. This is the resistance. There are no leaders. We are all leaders. We're all doing this together. Now somebody said to me, okay Rosa, awareness is the first step in the resistance. What's the second? <laughs> I said kicking butt is the second. <laughs> Let's take it back. However we do it, let's take it back. Let's take it back with our flyers. Get out there, it's not sexy. Put your flyers out, thousands of flyers. Everybody make those flyers and put them out. You get on the radio, you get on websites, you can comment on websites without identifying yourself. Go on, I'm on NRDC websites, I'm on Smart Growth websites. I comment, I put my website out there. I get many, many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of hits on my website. The more people who read this information and recognize the truth, the more people will say, stop this. We don't want this anymore. And we are going to win this. So let's do it. All right. Yeah. Thank you.